Good morning, church. Welcome back to Sunday service. Uh, we're glad that you're visiting with us online and hopefully soon back in the sanctuary. We're looking forward to that day and praying for it. Uh, this morning, if you would sing along with us, we're going to sing King of Glory. Lift up your gaze, be lifted up. Tell everyone how great the love, the love come down from heaven's gate to kiss the earth with hope and grace. Sing, who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty who is this king of glory the lord strong and mighty lift up your hands be lifted up let the redeemed declare the love and we bow down at heaven's gate to kiss the feet of hope and grace say who is this king of glory the lord strong and mighty who is this king of glory the lord Good morning, church. I'm not Brother Scott, so uh, if you're joining us wherever you are, thank you for being a part of, uh, even though we're not together physically, uh, we are together through one and the Spirit of Christ, and so I'd like to welcome you. And uh, this morning, uh, just right off, we're going to be in Romans chapter 6, 1 through 14, with a, a focus on verse 13. And while you turn there, Romans 6, I want to talk to you about um, a television show that uh, was on air when I was a teenager. I think we all enjoy makeover shows, right? Seeing something, you know, get freshened up and changed. And, and I think we'll all be in need of a makeover when all this is over, right? When they open the barber shops back up, the beauty shops back up, we are going to... Uh, they were making fun of me earlier because I'm going bald. Uh, I, 
I'm still hanging on. I'm trying, but I'm in desperate need of a trim, and so we're all going to make a rush back to uh, to the barber shops, to the beauty shops, and it's going to look like we all get makeovers. But there is this show. Maybe you've, uh, if you're old enough, you remember. It's called The Swan, and even as a crazy teenager, I remember thinking something's terribly wrong with this show because what they would do it wasn't just a makeover show they would give these so there's like a panel of people who would judge them based on their appearance and they would do plastic surgery give them new teeth you know as brother Scott likes to say stretch their face right tuck stuff away cut stuff off and um and so these people they would it wouldn't just be like a change of hairdo or a change of clothes I mean they would look like different people and I remember thinking, this is crazy, this is nuts, because they would do the interviews, and they had, like, the tape on their nose and bandages wrapped around their head because of all the stuff they had cut off and cut away. And I remember thinking, this is crazy. This is 2004 when this show was on. And I remember thinking just how nuts it is. And uh, so today, I kind of want to talk about that makeover, because I feel like sometimes we treat coming to Christ like it's a makeover. Like it's a change of appearance. Like we change some of the outward things about us. But the thing about that show is, you know, whatever those people were dealing with, whatever, you know, was going on, the insecurities or the low self-esteem, a, a new face or a new hairdo doesn't change that. There's just change on the outside, not change on the inside. And when we come to Christ, it's not just a change of outward appearance where we change some of the things that we say or some of the things that we do or we start going to church when we would stay at home that's not all that being a believer is. The change happens not just on the inside or on the outside, but the inside also. And so um, in Romans chapter 6, um, I just want to pick up in verse, I just want to read verse 13 for right now. But in Romans six thirteen, this is what the scripture says. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. Paul writes, he says, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Will you pray with me? Dear God, I just want to thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you are with us. God, I thank you for, uh, Lord, your, your scripture. And it says that, that the Holy Spirit is the counselor and the teacher and the God. And so, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would be present, that it would be moving in our hearts and minds, God, that you would show us, Lord, where we fall short. God, show us what needs to change in our life. And, uh, and Lord, so that you would be with our mind, that you would, um, uh, Lord, help us to learn, God, and help us to be changed uh, by you, God, for your honor and glory. And so, God, I just pray that wherever uh, this message might find people today, Lord, that you would bless them. Uh, Lord, for, for listening, God, that you would uh, bless and honor the reading of your word. And, and God, I thank you, Lord, that you love us. God, I thank you that you are patient with us, that you are kind. God, I thank you that you loved us so much that you would demonstrate that love, that Jesus would come to this earth, God, and give his life for our sin, God, that we could be changed. And so, Lord, I thank you for your son. I thank you for your word. I thank you for this time. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. All right, so right off, Paul is writing to um, some people, and, and just a little bit of context, in, in, in Romans chapter 5, you know, Paul is writing to people who, they grew up uh, under the law, they grew up thinking that they have to be as good as they possibly can to earn favor uh, with Christ. If he's writing to Jews, then, you know, these Jews, even Paul as a Pharisee said, according to the letter of the law, I was perfect, and how do you be better than perfect? Because they thought that they could please God with good works. And so Paul is telling them in Romans 5 that sin entered through one man. He, and in Romans 5 verse 18 it says, Consequently, just as one trespass from Adam resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. He's talking about Jesus. And Jesus coming in, so in verse 19 of chapter 5, he says, For just as through disobedience of one man the many were made sinners, and so also through the obedience of one man the many will be made righteous. And he talks about the law and being good. And he said, The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. He's saying, God gave us the Ten Commandments. God gave us the law, not so that so much that we should try to be perfect, but that we would see that we will never be perfect and that we need 
a helper. And so he says that the law was brought in, that trespass might increase, but where sin increased, here it is, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ. So Paul's talking about you can't be good enough. You can't work hard enough. It's all about grace. And so almost as if Paul was going to expect this reaction in verse uh, 1 of chapter 6. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. So how can we live in it any longer? It's like Paul knew that once he said, hey, guys, it's not about the law. It's not about working hard to be perfect. It's like Paul knew that people would take that and corrupt it and say, well, we can just do whatever we want. We can just live however we want because our sin is going to be covered by the grace of God. And so Paul counters that and saying, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? May it never be. He says, we are as those who have died to sin. So how can we still live in it? And you might think, that's ridiculous, right? Who would really think that? Who would really say that if God's gracious, then we can just sin and do whatever we want to and God's going to be okay with it and God's going to forgive it? Well, there was a monk back in the late 19th century, early 20th century. His name was uh, Gregory Rasputin. I think I put a... I put a picture of that dude on the computer. You can see he just looks crazy, right? They called him the Mad Monk. And that's one of the things that he actually taught. He said, you need to sin more so that God can show you more grace. And people bought this stuff. And he, you know, he, you can go read yourself. I'm not going to talk about it. But he did some very sketchy things, some very bad things with his disciples. And he justified all of this behavior because God is gracious and where sin abounds grace abounds much more he abused the grace of God and you know we might think this is crazy we wouldn't do this and I think consciously that's true but subconsciously I think that we excuse a lot of things that we do because we rest in the grace of God and that's great but Paul says that we've died to sin how can we still live in it so the first point I have for you today that we see in Romans 6 13 your first point is that we should refuse sin that we should refuse sin because Paul writes Romans 6 13 do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness so being a Christian is not just about uh, it does not equal uh, just getting a makeover just changing our outward appearance you know where we didn't go to church before, but we started going to church. We might dress a little different. We might talk a little different. But inside, there's no real change. Um, that is, is not a belief. I mean, imagine, I thought about this. Uh, I like home renovation shows. Uh, although when I watch them, I start looking around on how I can spend money uh, renovating my own house. So they're not good for me, but I enjoy them. And I thought, how funny would it be if uh, these people were selected for a home renovation show? And they bring them forward, you know, with a big picture in front of the house that they pull back so they can see their house. And so they do all that, and they go through this big to-do. But when they pull the picture back, the only thing that's changed is, like, they've cut the grass and maybe washed the outside. You know, they open the door, and everything is the same. All the furniture is still there. And it's like, what, what happened? Like, is this a joke? And um, I don't know. I thought maybe sometimes that we, we kind of treat our spiritual walk like that. We might do a little cleaning outside in the yard. We might cut the grass do a few cosmetic things, but really, there's no real renovation. There's no real change on the inside. That we're still hanging on and participating in that sin that Scripture says easily besets. And so, Paul says that we shouldn't offer ourselves as instruments of wickedness. We shouldn't give ourselves to sin, right? We should refuse sin. And one of the things that's interesting in this verse is that word instrument. Every other time in the New Testament, that word is translated it's translated weapon, or in one occurrence, it's translated as armor, but it's always a picture and symbolism of war, and to me, that gives this verse um, so much more uh, depth, or because he's saying, do not offer any part of yourself as a weapon of wickedness, as a weapon of war, and it, this verse becomes so much more sharp, because you think, 
uh, we should refuse sin because we have to understand that we, as, as the scripture says, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, right? There is a spiritual war that is going on around us, and so therefore we should not give in to sin because we shouldn't offer ourselves up as a weapon of wickedness. Think of that as a weapon that's going to be used against the kingdom of God, as a weapon that's going to be, uh, that's going to hurt or hinder uh, the work of God in, in our life or uh, in people around us. And so, so the first thing that I want you to see in Romans six thirteen is that we should refuse sin. The second thing is that we should receive grace. Because, it, again, in Romans 6, it says, Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. I know it's a lot of reading today, but chapter 6 of Romans is just so good. And so if you would just jump back up with me in, in verse 3 of Romans 6. Paul says, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, that we too may live a new life. And I think it's interesting to note here when it talks about being baptized into Christ Jesus, being baptized into his death, we're not talking about water. Um, something about that word, baptized. You see, you have, you have translations of words like, you know, with Spanish, we say gracias. The translation of gracias is thank you. Uh, but a transliteration is where you give uh, a word in another language you just give it English characters. You don't translate it at all. It's the word from the other language into English, and you just give it English characters. That's what the word baptize is. Because the Greek word is baptizo. Literally, what baptize means, translated, is to immerse. And see, when Paul's writing about that here, Paul is not saying that we're baptized, we're immersed in water in Christ. What he's saying here is that we are immersed in Christ, that we're immersed in his death, being raised in life. There, there's no water. He's talking about us being immersed in the death of Christ and the symbolism of what that means, us being immersed into the, the baptism into death, it says. And so what this is all about, um, this is all about us giving our life to him. It has nothing to do with water. This is all about the resurrection uh, power that Jesus offers us because I want you to understand that, that this whole being baptized into his death being raised to walk a newness of life um, and what he says when he says that not to offer yourself as a part of as an instrument of wickedness but offering ourselves to God as those who have brought from death to life my friends that's only possible through belief in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ it's only possible through the resurrection um, that only through the resurrection are we able to exchange that death for life. Um, I, I think about uh, Mephibosheth. And if you remember the Old Testament story, Mephibosheth was a son of Jonathan, right? Who was so grandson of King Saul. And when there was a, a, a change in power, when David became king, um, well, the nurses grabbed Mephibosheth and tried to run because normally what happened when a new king would come into power is he would clean house uh, from the old rule and reign so he would you know murder all the sons and murder any blood ties to the former king and so this nurse grabbed Mephibosheth and in a hurry of leaving of fleeing she she dropped him and she made him lame and so Mephibosheth lived his life hiding in the wilderness I, I think being scared for his life waiting for the day that David would discover that he was alive and that he would come and, and take Mephibosheth's life but David found him one day but it wasn't to kill him. It was to bring him out of isolation. It was to bring him out of the land of, land of not, not Lodabar, uh, a land of nothingness. And, um, and so David found him, and he brought him from a life of poverty, and he gave him a room in the palace. He gave him a seat at the table. David offered Mephibosheth to exchange his rags for a robe. And in that same way, the picture is perfect that we're covered in sin, that in and of ourselves, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death further down. 
uh, in verse in chapter 6. But it says, but the gift of God is eternal life. And so Jesus wants us to change our death for his life. He wants to take our rags, and he wants to give us a robe. He wants to give us a seat at the table. See, he wants us to come and exchange our sin for righteousness. Right? He wants us to exchange our imperfection for his perfection. He wants us to exchange our death for life. But it's only possible through the resurrection. It's only possible through Jesus' death. Not good works. Not trying to be perfect. And the, it's an oxymoron right, or it's a paradox. It, it, it doesn't quite make sense. How can life come from death? Well, we can see it all in nature. Um, my son, he's gotten big into to hockey um, through the quarantine. Courtney and I have introduced him to a lot of the movies that we grew we uh, grew up watching. You know, um, Sandlot, right, Little Giants, and I introduced him to the Mighty Ducks. And so he's crazy about hockey and wants to play, but I broke the bad news to him. There ain't no hockey teams around here anywhere. And so what he's done, he's always wanting to get out in the yard with his roller blades and and I saw him the other day, and he was hitting pine cones, which we have a ton of pine trees. We've hit him with bats. Now we're hitting him with hockey sticks, just trying to get him out of the yard. But you think, like a pine cone and any, any other kind of seed, like it's alive, it's a part of the tree, but what it does is it begins to die. It falls to the ground, continues to decompose, but it releases a seed, or it plants a seed in the ground. And that dead thing in the right conditions with water, with sunlight, it produces new life. My friends, it's the same way. That if we truly want to live, if we want to have eternal, abundant life, it only comes through death. What God showed us in nature, it only comes through the, resurre- through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so that's what Paul's talking about. He's talking about dying to sin so that we can live for Christ, so that we can be changed, not just have a makeover, but so that we can be transformed from the inside out, so that we can become something else. Um, and see, uh, I know for me, I didn't care about going to church before I was saved. only reason I went was because I was invited. I had tried to read the Bible before, but it didn't make any sense to me, and I didn't like to read anyway. I'd rather watch a movie, which I think is pretty much, you know, most of us. Um, but... When I got invited to church and went just because I was invited, uh, a man pulled me to the side, asked me if I had ever accepted Christ into my, into my heart, if I'd ever been saved. And, I mean, I didn't know what that meant, so I asked him, you know, can you explain that to me? And so he told me what sin was. He told me what sin did, that sin separated us from God and that we were all sinners. And I didn't need any convincing because I knew that I was, uh, you know, a bad kid and I had done things that I wasn't supposed to do. And so then he told me about Jesus that he offers us life, that we can have eternal life, and that when we die here, that we can live in heaven with him for an eternity. And so, to me, it seemed like a deal that was too good to pass up. And so, I asked Jesus to save me. I asked for Jesus to forgive me. And when I didn't care about going to church before, well, as Brother Scott says, my wanter changed. When I received the grace of God, uh, I wanted to go to church. I wanted to be around other believers and to grow and to learn uh, the Bible when it was disinteresting to me before and I couldn't understand it it held new life for me I wanted to stay up at all hours of the night so that I could read the story of what God has done for us and when I was selfish before and I didn't care about helping anybody I only wanted to help myself well I found joy in serving others and helping others you see it was total transformation which when we received the grace of God that transformation takes place. Not just a cosmetic touch-up, but a change from the inside out. And, uh, and so, my friends, we should refuse sin as we see Paul talk about in the Scripture. Um, we should receive grace when he says, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And then the last thing that I have for you is that we should resolve to be holy. Resolve to be holy because... That last part of Romans six thirteen, it says that we should offer every part of ourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. So he says, do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life 
and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument, or if you remember, as a weapon of righteousness. Um, several years ago, I read in a book, uh, Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster, and he said something that kind of floored me. And uh, one of the things he said is, um, well, he said that large tasks require great sacrifice for a moment. Then he says small things require constant sacrifice. And that just made me think about my own life. And, uh, and so I thought, you know, that's so true because when we make big decisions for Christ, well, there's excitement there. I'm, I'm going to change my job or we're going to sell our house and we're going to go, you know, on the mission field. These big decisions that require a lot of change, there's a lot of excitement generated behind that. And, you know, and for my own life, I think, it's easier to make those big decisions. But what's harder and more painstaking is to make the smaller sacrifices day in and day out where you get up and you choose to honor and obey God over yourself. And, he, and, and Richard Foster, he kind of talks, he says it's, uh, it's like sugar and salt. You know, uh, unless you're like me, you eat way too much candy and chocolate, right? Uh, sugar is something that's... Um, very spread out, you know, your desserts. And those are big decisions. That's the sugar. But your meat and potatoes, right, those are the small sacrifices. Um, you know, the, the, that nutrition comes from the constant sacrifices. It's like, you know, and those big decisions. I don't know, for some reason when I was reading through this and I got my head on the, the weapons of war, you know, the instruments, the weapons of uh, unrighteousness and weapons of righteousness. I started thinking about just, you know, battles and things in my head. And I thought those big, exciting decisions, they're like big events, like, you know, storming the beaches of Normandy or, or driving the tanks into the capital, you know, and just uh, taking over. And um, But once sin is dethroned in our life, once we give our life to Christ, once that big decision is made that we're going to follow Jesus, um, the seemingly small, unimportant things that follow are also detrimental to walk and detrimental to faith. Because you think, and so I started thinking about battles, and, and I thought, uh, you know, we've read, I've read stories and, um, about battles who the big event, you know, storming in, the overthrow of of tyranny is done but they weren't able to pull out troops right away because there became factions and it was uncon unconventional guerrilla warfare which was so much harder than just lining up across the battlefield uh, with an opposing army and I started thinking isn't that how sin is in our life I isn't that how Satan works in our life because once we overthrow sin once we overthrow Satan and we give our life to Christ you know, we believe that there's no way that we can lose our salvation. So the war is won, but the battle's far from over because Satan goes into a guerrilla warfare tactic with us. It's, it's, not so, it, it, it's setting traps. You know, it's, it's watching our behavior to see how he can trip us up, how he can attack us when we're not looking, how he can catch us off guard. And so, my friends, that's why we need to resolve to be holy. That's why we need to, to come under the firm conviction, set our minds to offering. I like how Paul says, offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. It's like um, Richard Foster says, in the big things and the little things, the direction of your life, you know, the keys to your life, handing them over, giving God control, but also trusting him with the little things, like what we're going to love, what we're going to enjoy, how we're going to speak, how we're going to act. Um, how we're going to live. It's the small things also. Um, and so uh, we have a helper. We are not alone. Um, just to finish up in, in Romans 6, verse 11, uh, Paul writes, And in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. Then he talks about not letting sin reign in our mortal body that we obey its evil desires. And then in verse 14 he says, For sin shall no longer be your master, because you're not under the law, but under grace. And the beauty to that is, is that grace does cover a multitude of sins. That where sin abounds, grace abounds 
all the more. And we're not alone. As I prayed, the Holy Spirit is with us. Scripture says that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Scripture says that he'll never leave us or forsake us. Scripture says, um, this is so comforting, that he's with us always, right, until the very end. And, um, and so when we are killing it, right, sorry, when we're uh, doing everything that we should be doing, he is there. But even when we fail, even when we mess up, even when we find ourselves in tough spots, uh, he's also there. And uh, I, I've got a, two more stories that I'll share, and, um, and then I'm done. But I read, uh, so in, in reading about different war stories and things, I read about a, a country that was going, that there was a revolution that was taking place, and an American citizen found himself um, in a very bad place, and he was uh, grabbed, he was arrested, and he was thrown before a firing squad. They're about to execute this person. And what somebody else did is that they ran in with an American flag, and they wrapped this person in this flag, and they shouted to the firing line, if you shoot through this flag, then you will incur the wrath of the United States. So much that it was to say that not only was this an American citizen, but this American citizen, even though he was in a different country, he was a representative, and he was a part of the nation, the United States of America. And so I was just thinking about how that pertains to us. Now, we, we, we may find ourselves in, in predicaments. We may find ourselves in places we shouldn't be, places we ought not to be. But if we are believers, if we've given our life to Christ, if we are children of God, then no matter where we are, that's who we are. Could you think, even that prodigal son, um, when he ran away from the father, pretty much ran as far away as he could, you know, as a little Jewish boy working with pigs, that was unthought of, made himself unclean. But my question is, at what point in that son's running did he become not a son anymore? At what, how far did that son have to go before his father wasn't his father anymore? And so here's the thing. He could have ran as far as he wanted to run. He could have done what he did and more. But the fact is, is that he was his father's son, and nothing would change that. And my friends, it's the same way for us. So we're, we're to refuse sin. We're to receive the grace of God, grace of God and we're resolved to resolve to be holy, uh, which is a large pursuit. It's hard. It's hard being holy when we live in a place with so many temptations, so many uh, traps. But here's the thing. No matter where we find ourselves, like the flag that was draped uh, over that American citizen, it's the same for us, that we're children of the king, and that we are clothed in Christ's righteousness, whether we think we deserve it or not. And uh, so I want to say one more thing. I've been reading a book called The Pursuit of Holiness by Jerry Bridges. And uh, I read something in this book that I have to share. And it's about holiness. And so if you'll suffer me to uh, one more time, he quotes John Brown when it says that holiness does not consist in mystic speculations, enthusiastic fervors, or uncommanded austerities. It consists in thinking as God thinks and willing as God wills. And this is what he said that was so interesting to me. He says, Neither does holiness mean, uh, as is so often thought, adhering to a list of do's and don'ts, mostly don'ts. Because if you think, when we think about being holy, or, or the scripture says being holy as, as God is holy, or being perfect as God is perfect, our mind, or at least mine does, immediately goes to, the things we shouldn't do. Now, there, 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 are, there are a couple of things we, oh, we should go to church. I should read my Bible. But I need to stop saying this. I need to stop going. I need to stop watching this. I need to stop listening to this. And so you think it's all of these, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. Don't, it's, all, it's all these don'ts. And my friends, we're, we're looking at it in the wrong way. Because what Jerry Bridges writes is, when Christ came into the world, he said, I have come to do your will, O God. This is the example we are to follow in all of our thoughts, all of our actions, in every part of our character. The ruling principle that motivates and guides us should be the desire to follow Christ in doing the will of the Father. It's not about don't do this, don't do that, don't say this, don't say that, because if all we're focusing on are the things that are behind us and the things that we're trying to leave behind, then we're not focusing on what's before us and the will of Christ. So, so our focus should not so much be the things that we're trying to leave behind, 
but it's the goal before us. It's the line, but it's, it's Christ and His will and us pursuing Him. And so, my friends, holiness is a lofty pursuit, but the good news is we're not alone. He's with us, and um, He gives us help. Uh, the Holy Spirit, the God, the teacher, the counselor. You know, we talk about being a believer isn't a one-time decision, but it's a journey. That Every day we wake up and we are pursuing and following Christ. And so I would encourage you, refuse sin, my friends, and especially being stuck at home during this time, um, the Internet can be a dangerous place. So we are to refuse sin, not to offer ourselves as weapons of unrighteousness, right? We should receive the grace, understand that our life comes from Jesus' death, that it's a total transformation that takes place and not just a um, superficial um, makeover. My friends, and we should be resolute, resolve to be holy, um, Lord, because He is holy. And, uh, and so, church, uh, I just want to tell you that I love you. I miss you. The day is coming again when we'll be together. Oh, my goodness, how sweet it's going to be uh, when we can hug necks, when we can shake hands, and when we can worship in the same room. And so uh, thank you guys for being so good to me and my family uh, over the years. And um, uh, We'll be looking at Naaman. Uh, I'll be in the center seat. I, I like being in the side seats a little bit better and somebody else driving, but tonight I'll be there and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. Then uh, Wednesday night, we're back in Romans and uh, it's really turning up the heat this week. Uh, Paul's going to uh, get nitty and gritty and of course I'm on at 7 and Justin hits the airwaves at 7.30. And then I want to talk to you about next Sunday. Next Sunday. Uh, weather permitting, we're going to be over at the Family Life Center. We're going to rope off the parking lot on the north side of the gym. And we want you to bring your lawn chairs and still social distance. We don't want any hugging and kissing uh, just yet. But uh, uh, we're going to be out there. We're going to have the band live. Uh, we're going to preach out there. It's going to be a beautiful day. If not, we're going to do this. Then for the remainder of the month of May, uh, we're going to be here doing this. I think uh, Jake's going to be preaching one Sunday. I want everybody to get a chance at this a strange preaching uh, to an empty room. So Jake will preach one Sunday in May. And then the first Sunday in June, here's our plan. If ever, it's, It could change, but we're going to have our 8.30 worship and our 10 o'clock worship. We're going to 8.30 folks come in. And uh, if we need to add more worship services to space people out, we might do that. But uh, 8.30, come in. Going to get those folks out of here. We're going to clean a little bit, sanitize things, and then come in at 10 o'clock. And uh, we'll have another worship service. We're going to do that for the month of June. And if everything goes right and things can prove, uh, we're going to try to start back our regular schedule. That means Sunday school teachers get ready. July, uh, we're coming back. And uh, we'll have our uh, Sunday school, du dual Sunday schools, dual worships, uh, and then uh, Sunday night service uh, coming back live and in person. And also Wednesday night. Then we'll wait a little bit later, a few weeks. Mr. Ken will need us some weeks to get ready. And we hopefully bring back our Wednesday night meal and sometime this summer have everything back to order. Between them, be careful. <coughs> Excuse me. Be wise. And, uh, and keep your hands clean. And, and uh, if you're sick, stay home and, and all of that good stuff. Uh, on the screen is uh, the ways you can give to support the ministries of White Baptist Church. I know we've got a lot of new friends out there. There's some people watching on the live stream. You don't, you've never been here. And we hope that when time comes, you'll come see us. And uh, maybe you want to support the ministries. But uh, we love you. And uh, we'll see you all back at 630 uh, for Table for Three. See you later.
when I